The following segments are pre-recorded and sponsored by Longworth Productions. Helping seniors on Triad Today. Hello everyone, I'm Jim Longworth and welcome to another edition of Try It Today and uh, we want to thank our good friends here at the Senior Botanical Garden and we'll tell you more about them later on and later on is when the round table shows up and they'll get into all sorts of controversial topics. So I hope you'll stay with us for the entire half hour. Some great guests and important information coming your way. Speaking of important information and great guests, here they are. On my right, a visitor who's been with us frequently and we love him around here, Mark Hensley is Associate State Director for Community Outreach and Advocacy for AARP. North Carolina, and Mark brought along a special guest with him today, back to the center, John Lee, Executive Director of Age Friendly for Scythe. Good to see you guys. Thank Good you morning. Very much. Yeah. Mark, I'm going to start with you. What is the AARP Age Friendly Initiative? Okay, so first of all, it's not just about older adults, but it's about everybody. We're all aging, and so simply age friendly is where a community deliberately is transforming and changing to address the needs of all people as they age. Best example, a cut out sidewalk, a cut out curb so you can go from the sidewalk to the road without taking a step. That's just as advantageous to a mom with a jogging stroller as it is to a person with Absolutely. a wheelchair. Absolutely, yeah, that's, I didn't think about that. John, uh, hone in more on the mission of your particular group. What, what is the mission? Yeah. Actually, Age Friendly for Scythe was created back in 2015, or it began its development. And the real purpose was to bring together organizations in Forsyth County that were dedicated to supporting the needs of the aging population with a vision that if we can come around the table together, we can do more effective uh, collaborative planning and be more successful in meeting the needs of the aging population in Forsyth. Right, and I'm glad you mentioned that key word successful because I yeah. want to ask you, I know you partner with a lot of agencies. What, uh, what kind of things have you accomplished and worked on uh, so far? Sure. One of the first things that the entity uh, decided to do was really based upon a value that was we want to make data-driven decisions. So an investment was made in surveying uh, through phones, uh, phone calls, uh, individuals in Forsyth, 16 and over, to really get a sense of what their needs were. Right. And it covered a number of categories, including physical health, mental health, access to services, mobility, um, social engagement. And that kind and of database it. and information helps you with things, like even like with the example that, that Mark gave, to sort of decide what needs to be done. Exactly. Yeah. So that really evolved into a report that uh, is considered an action plan for moving forward with making changes in Forsyth County to improve outcomes for the aging population and create a livable community, which is an important theme that goes back to the work of Absolutely, and in, and in that vein of what you're talking about, what's in store for you and the, and the organization in 2023? Really good question. The uh, COVID pandemic did have an impact on some of our work because so many, much of it was outreach and engagement and advocacy. So we're at the point now of really taking a step back. I've been spending a lot of time meeting with the board members to get a sense of what has been successful, what the opportunities are moving forward. And we expect that one of the things we'll do really very quickly is to update the data set of needs because again, it's now six or seven years old, number one. Right. And number two, our environment has shifted a lot because of COVID and we want to pick up on what needs may have changed because of that. Right, we have a few seconds left. What John's doing is really important to your mission, isn't it, Mark? It is, so AARP partnered with the World Health Organization. This is a nationwide movement about transforming communities so they're responsive to the needs of people. So think about bikes, pedestrians, and cars sharing the road safely. Think about parks, think about how we're really creating community, and the biggest challenge we have is affordable and, um, and one level living for people as they age. Absolutely. Guys, I want to do something here very quickly. Uh, AgeFriendlyForSight.org is the website you can go to for more information to learn about what John's doing uh, for all of us. And uh, also you can visit AARP.org.nc for more information about uh, that fine organization. Guys, happy holidays and thanks for all you do for everybody. Thanks Thank very you. much. Appreciate the opportunity. We'll be right back after this. Mm -hmm. 
need help buying food, everyone needs help sometimes. Food and Nutrition Services may be able to help you buy food and free up your money for other expenses, such as utilities and medicine. To receive FNS assistance, households must meet income limits. You may be able to get assistance even if you own a home, car, land, property, or have a retirement plan or money in the bank. Second Harvest Food Bank of Northwest North Carolina team members can help you with the application process over the phone. To receive help or if you have any questions, call 336-422-7758. Hi, I'm Jim Longworth reminding you that Try It Today is now streaming on WFMY Plus, available free on Roku and Amazon Fire TV. Back now on uh, Try Today, and let's talk about being connected and helping the community. And we're going to do that with two ladies who know all about this topic. On my, and both have been visitors to us on the show before. We're so glad to have them back. On my immediate right is uh, Lakeisha Jordan. She's executive director of Winston Net. And back in the center of things, as always, uh, Florian Schmidt is a senior program officer for Z. Smith Reynolds Foundation. Ladies, thanks for coming today. Thank, Thank you for you. having us. Sorry, I'm going to start with you. Remind us what the mission of the foundation is. Yes, Z. Smith Reynolds is a statewide private family foundation. And over the last 80 plus years, we have awarded over $600 million across the state to improve the lives of all North Carolinians. And I'm happy to say some of that money has gone to Winston Net and to the Forsyth County Digital Equity and Inclusion Task Force. Yeah, I want to I find out about the, uh, the task force and everything. So I'm going to spend some time with the Lakeisha. We're going to ignore you for just a minute. That's all right. <laughs> That's great. Uh, tell us about the mission of Winston Net for people who maybe just moved in the area and they don't know. Winston Net has been here for 21 years, and so our goal has always been to bridge the digital divide to ensure that everyone has equal access to technology, to internet, and to devices and digital literacy. And so we've been doing this work, and we're proud to do this work in this community. We also have a computer technology centers in all of our city rec centers oh, and some that. churches and some nonprofit churches like Praise Assembly Church Ministries and nonprofits like Habitat for Humanity. Okay. Now, uh, but just let's make sure we, we know what digital equity is about. So just help me understand. What do you, what do you mean by that? So digital equity is just ensuring that every person, every community member has equal access to internet, reliable internet, right, right. Um, has access to technology um, meaning devices, and access to digital literacy. So what we know is that we live in a very, very technology-driven community. Right. And so as things continue to progress with technology, we have to ensure that our community stays on top of that. So I just think what you're doing is great with that because think about when the pandemic started and a lot of things went remote. And in some areas, kids didn't have access to, uh, to Internet. You're reliable, right. as you say, good, reliable, high speed. So I'm glad you're making a difference on that. Now, uh, Sorian referred to a digital initiative, something I'm trying to paraphrase, but you said, what is that all about? Is Forsyth for County Digital Equity Initiative. So Winstonet is the lead agency of the Forsyth County Digital Equity Initiative. And as you just stated about the pandemic, so around two years ago, there were groups that came together, starting with Forsyth Futures, Winston-Salem Foundation, Winston-Salem State University, Wake Forest University. Winston and, of course, City of Winston-Salem, the Boston Thurm Thurman community, the Housing Authority, and community members came together and said, hey, what do we do about this? This pandemic is really showing its face and showing us that our community members, some of them will be left behind. Yeah. And so how do we support this? What do we do? And so from that was developed the Forsyth County Digital Equity Plan. And this plan is a very comprehensive plan that tells us in Forsyth County what we need to do to ensure digital equity and inclusion in our community. And, and y'all and some of your partners, too, receives, understand it, uh, because I think you emailed me about this one day, received this huge grant from the city itself, right? Now, how is that funding being used? Oh, absolutely. So the city of Winston-Salem awarded Winston-Net and Forsyth County Digital Equity $2 million in ARPA dollars, which is the American Rescue Plan right. dollars. Right. And so what we plan to do with that, and we're very grateful and very excited, what we plan to do is that is just really look at the need and target those who live in qualified census tracts um, and provide at least 1,250 individuals with devices, digital literacy training. We're going to go to the MLK Rec Center and we are going to create what's called a computer uh, arts and music lab. And great. we're going to take that lab and we're going to ensure that folks are able to uh, 
publish music and, and do a lot of great things. So we're I, excited about I, it. I, I bet you are. Boy, what a great example of what your mission's about too, Sori. And I know you're proud of Winston Net. Absolutely. We're excited this is happening. Up on screen, winstonnet.org, or you can call 336-624-6143 or visit, and you can also visit uh, zsr.org for more information about the foundation. Sori and Lakeisha, thanks for all you're doing, ladies. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. All right. We'll be right back after this. You know, it's hard to believe the Safe Sober program has been going strong for over 30 years. And over 600,000 students have made the pledge to stay safe and sober on prom night. You know, Griff, it's had a huge impact on our community. Yeah, you're right, David. And now we're making sure the message continues year round. So everyone can join us in supporting our students. Learn more and take the pledge at safesober.com, sponsored by Daggett Schuler. Back now on Try Today, I always glad we can spend a few minutes with the good folks from Duke Energy and let us bring us up to speed on what's going on around in the area. And with us, our good buddy who's been with us many times before, Jimmy Flight, is Director of Local Government and Community Relations for Duke Energy. And Jimmy brought a special guest with him, first time visitor to the garden and to the show, Paul Hicks, Triad Vice President for Zone Operations at Duke Energy. Good to see you guys. Yeah, thanks for having us. Jimmy, I'm going to start with you. Before we get to our main topic, I want to sort of backtrack on something because I know it's on people's minds. They've read about this in the news and that's the recent targeted attack on your substation there in Mooresville. Just a horrible thing that some, well, you can't say it, but since it's my show, some, <laughs> some idiots did it or whatever. Anyway, give us an update on that. Yeah, and it's actually Moore County, so around the Southern Pines okay. area um, is where this occurred. So we did have a targeted attack on two of our Duke Energy substations in that area, um, and it did significant damage. Um, created a significant power outage for about 45,000 customers. And many of those, it took almost four days to respond and, and get the power restored. They shot the place up, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. We found bullet casings at the site. Uh, both sites, are. Um, we're working with law enforcement at the state, federal, and local levels um, in, the, in the research. But, you know, it's something that, that's just awful, you know, that happened. And fortunately, you know, our guys responded well. You know, we, we worked around the clock and um, actually got power restored sooner than we thought, we thought it would take. But for Duke Energy, you know, our responsibility to, to operate the grid, we're the largest grid operator in the country. Um, and so the responsibility to maintain the grid and maintain security is paramount. Um, and we've got a great, you know, um, top-notch group of folks that monitor threat assessments and respond to threats 24-7. Uh, for Duke Energy, we're actually spending, we've got plans to spend $75 billion over the next 10 years in grid investment and grid updates. Right. And a lot of that will be for cyber and physical security at substations. And so it's sad that we need all that, but it's, it's so good to know you guys are on top of the situation, though. Thank you. Yeah, very much so. And, and I brought Paul, I asked Paul to come join us today so he could kind of talk about what this grid improvement work is that we're doing here locally and we've got a plan to do. Yeah, Paul, one thing I was going to ask you is we see, and I've seen, a lot of utility crews working all over the triad recently. And uh, what kind of work are they doing? Well, the, those crews you're seeing, they're a uh, direct re re reflection of the investments that we're making that Jimmy mentioned. You know, here in the triad in uh, this year, uh, we're investing uh, $145 million Man. to maintain and improve the grid. Uh, you know, that increases in 2023. Uh, we have planned improvements that are going to push uh, our investment here over $200 million in, in 2023. Uh, the work that we're doing is really a combination of things. We're replacing uh, old, aging, underground infrastructure. We're also increasing the capacity of our overhead lines. Uh, and I would say, uh, importantly, certainly impor importantly for us and for our customers, a lot of the work that we're doing is centered around the installation of self-healing teams. Okay. And that's, you know, it's technology. It's new technology for us. remind everybody what you mean, self-healing. Well, that's technology that allows us to detect and isolate outages and restore power to customers to, to help avoid you know, a sustained outage. Right. Before we run out of time, one thing I want to ask you, Paul, too, is are you seeing measurable results from, from the investments and improvements that are going on? Yes, sir. It, it's measurable and significant. Uh, this year alone, uh, the 27 self-healing teams that we have have helped us prevent over 27,000 sustained customer outages. Wow. 
and avoid over 10 million minutes of interrupted service. Jim, we just have a few seconds left. Uh, anything the public can do the, the, to try to report or prevent or be on top of anything if they see something going on or whatever? Yeah, exactly. Kind of related to that outage in, in Moore County. Um, just, you know, like, like this whole thing, see something, say something. So, you know, an informed public um, is a great defense against um, activity like we, we saw there. So if somebody sees something suspicious, a vehicle that doesn't look like it should be at a, a Duke Energy substation, right. call 911. Right. And our law enforcement folks are going to help us uh, maintain the grid as well. Excellent advice. Up on screen, the website duke-energy.com. Uh, uh, and I hope you will visit that with lots of good information. And I just applaud you guys, Jimmy and, and Paul, for all you're doing to keep uh, uh, keep all of us safe and with electricity and, and all powered up Great. in these difficult and challenging times. Thanks, guys. Thank you. We appreciate it. We'll be right back after this. No matter the challenges, we were there. Whatever the struggles, we were there. And as the sun comes out, bringing the promise of a brighter tomorrow, we will still be here. We're Duke Energy, and we're building a smarter energy future for you. Hi, I'm Jim Longworth, reminding you to catch my column, Longworth at Large, and Yes Weekly every week. It's available throughout the triad, or you can go online, yesweekly.com. Back now on Try Today, time to talk with Mr. Theater, which we do once a month, and whenever we can grab him and get him over here, Dave Briggs, director of High Point Theater. Welcome back to the show. Thanks, Jim. It's always a pleasure to be here. We have some fun holiday things to talk about, but before we do that, I want to bring up something you sent me an email about one day, and that's ticket resellers. They're not necessarily scalpers, but I call them scammers, and they're a different thing, but they're ticket resellers. What do we need to be aware of? Well, the biggest thing you need to be aware of with, with a ticket reseller is that they can charge, unlike the, the a scalping fee, which is if there's a limit on what you can sell a ticket above a ticket price. Right, right. If, if a ticket to the theater is $30, a scalper might charge 100 and he goes to jail. Right. But in this case. And, and if he only charges $4, he doesn't go to jail. Right, right. But in this case, um, a, a, a ticket reseller will, will go to the venue. They will, they will put an ad online and you'll buy a ticket through them, then they will go to the venue and buy the ticket at the face value that the ticket is being sold, and then they're gonna sell it to you for an exorbitant amount of money, and they're gonna claim in the small print that all of these additional things are fees. Fees, so, so they're you not buy a jacking up for, the price, they're jacking up exactly. the fees. Exactly, so we had a show, for instance, that the, the, our ticket price was $35, their ticket price on a social site was sixty-seven dollars. Wow! And I looked at it. And said, they have nothing to do with us, and so I read through all the fine print, and that happens. I really encourage folks call the box office at any venue, whether it's the High Point Theater, or the Tanger Center, the Stevens Center, wherever the Greensboro Coliseum. I don't care. Call the box office and speak to a person directly, or if you're going to do it online, make sure that you get their official website. Right. Because if you Google something, if you Google an artist, they're going to, it's going to populate with all these false right. things. Find the original, the real deal. So beware. That's good advice. Okay. Now to some upcoming shows, holiday related. Some of them are High Point Ballet's Nutcracker, December 16th, 17th, and 18th, and. Uh, collaterally, the Land of the Sweets, also December 17th. Tell me about it. So High Point Ballet, Gary and Rita Taylor do an amazing job with this show. It's a beautiful, beautifully costumed, beautiful sets, and of course, the amazing Tchaikovsky music, and their their choreography is outstanding. So the, 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 the Friday, Saturday shows are at 7.30. There's a, su a Sunday matinee at 2 o'clock. Right. And then the Land of the Sweets is basically just the second act of The Nutcracker, which features the sugar plum fairies Kids and the mice. That. Kids love it. And yeah. it's, it's very fun. All right. After the holiday, uh, on January, Saturday, January 7th, 7.30 p.m., is the Songs of John Prime. This is uh, Billy Prine, who is John's brother. John passed away about 18 months ago, and he, a singer-songwriter of incredible note. I mean, everybody from the Rolling Stones to, to Emmy Lou Harris have recorded his songs, and uh, he's truly a tre an American treasure. He did more with three chords than any other 
the singer-songwriter ever. Billy is going to be giving a tribute to John, and it's a lot of his music. It's Christmas in Prison, which is the perfect for this time of year, or Hello in There, uh, Angel from Montgomery, just to name a few of the wonderful songs. All right. And then uh, finally, Friday, January the 13th, Mario... Is, he's a magician? What is that Mario, about? Mario the Maker Magician. Uh, this, uh, this is a magician who combines magic with science, technology, engineering, and math, and of course art skills as well with his magic. It's really geared for children. Right. Uh, tickets are $10. There are no discounts on this show. It's $10. And uh, so bring out the whole family. They're going to have a great time. He's, it's, it's, he's part mime, part clown, part magician. And I think folks are going to have a ball with this show. That's neat. My wife, Pam hired a magician one time to make me disappear, but it didn't, <laughs> it didn't, it didn't happen. Up on screen, highpointtheater.com. Remember to put in two Ts there, highpointtheater.com. As Dave said, that's the official website. But more importantly, if you want tickets, make sure you call the box office, 887-3001. That's the real deal, and I hope you'll check it out. Hope you'll. Are you going to stay over for the round table? Sure, if you like. All right. We'll be right back after this. Every cookie sold in the Girl Scout cookie program helps girls learn lifelong lessons in people skills, decision making, money management, goal setting, and business ethics. It's amazing how much you can learn from a cookie. The Girl Scout cookie program. Think outside the box. Back now on Try Today, just about time for the round table, but a quick shout out to our good friends here at Senior Botanical Garden in Kernersville. You can check out the website, check out the garden year round. There's always something going on here, beautiful things to see. And if you want to see more beautiful things, right here they are. Three beautiful things. Ogie Overman, the great broadcaster, uh, he's always sitting on my right, but you know he's on the left. And then Dave Briggs, who we've held over from the High Point Theater segment, Keith Granberry, founder of Helping Hands uh, Consultants. And before we get to the, just want to mention to the guys in the audience, a programming note, the roundtable is going to take a few weeks off. Try it today, we'll still be on air, but we will be back together on January 11th, just a programming note. Now, uh, guys, first topic. Uh, we're all glad that basketball star Brittany Griner is uh, back home, uh, away from this free, from, from, uh, she's free from unjust uh, Russian imprisonment. That was horrible. But in general, is the freedom of any one person worth being swapped for an arms dealer who facilitated mass murders in Africa and other countries? Ogie, what do you think? Well, first of all, the guy had been in prison 11 years. The reason it took so long to get Griner home was because we were putting assets in play over there to sit to follow that guy every step he makes. Right. We're going to have people there on the surface. It doesn't seem fair. Of course not. But it'll be but we, we got her home. I yeah. mean, you could do what you got to do. You got to take the. Yeah, I'm, right. I'm, I'm tickled to death that Brit Brittany Griner is back home. But I think it does show a lack of negotiating skills on this current administration. I think it was a bad swap. And I think there, I, went, I looked at a survey this morning and said 90% of Americans feel like we got out coached. Okay, key. Uh, I think it was. I think it was great. Uh, number one, the the past administration had an opportunity to get the other guy out that they wanted, but they passed on. Yeah, him. right. So therefore, here we are uh, with Brittany Griner, and she she was in jail unjustly. So I think that if they put assets in place to follow him, I think it was a great swap. Okay, a restaurant owner in Richmond, Virginia, recently refused to serve members of the conservative Christian Family Foundation because the restaurant owner's staff felt uncomfortable. Many of them were LBGTQ and felt uncomfortable around the anti-gay Christian group. Should the restaurant owner be applauded? Or should he have his business license revoked, Ogie? Well, you know, it's, it's the other side of the coin, you know. And I'm, no, he shouldn't have it. I, I think we ought to just let the chips fall where they may. I mean, see if he I gets, applaud the guy myself, but see. I can see the other side is going to say, well, if you don't serve gay people, you can't. You can't you know. uh, be gay and throw okay. straight people out. Exactly. Right. Uh, Dave. I think neither. He doesn't get applauded and he doesn't get, he doesn't get fined. This is First Amendment. He has the right to do that. Where it's really going to hurt him is that that group that was kicked out has friends. They're going to tell them they don't, they don't support our cause. They're yeah. not welcome there. 
Weird situation, Keith. What do you think? I think he needs to get fined as a person who's who has people from their family and in, in the past who has been excluded from being able to come in to restaurants or even use water fountains. I think it. I think it's absurd that they would not uh, serve someone who came in. It is a business. They should be more be more sensitive to the other Absolutely. side. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, automobile child restraints are required in all fifty states. You say, well, so what, Jim? That's that's good. Yet the fines and sentencing varies from state to state. Meanwhile, unrestrained infants and children continue to be killed tragically in car crashes. Here's my question. Should Congress make it a federal crime with prison time for a parent whose child is killed because they did not put the child in a restraint, which is required? Ogie. I don't have a problem with a federal uh, mandate, but I, I don't think prison time should be mandated. All right. Uh, Dave. I don't think it's a federal law. The FBI is not going to investigate this. It's so, not a federal law now. It's I'm saying it should be. It shouldn't be. I think the SBI and the, and the State Highway Patrol do that. They bring a case, and then it's up to a judge. Gee, I don't think it should be a federal crime. All right. In light of the recent mass shootings at a Colorado nightclub and a Virginia Walmart, should large public establishments like those be required by state law to have body scanners and armed security at the main entrance? Ogie. Jim, it seems like this comes up at least once a month. You we know, talk we about talk about it with about schools it and now. I, well, the root of the problem is getting guns off the street. Period. Day break. Uh, those scanners are, are very effective. The problem is somebody has to man the scanners. So it's going to be one or the other. There's a, there's a, a cost associated with that for any business. All right, Keith. I think it's very difficult to have scanners in every business, and I, I think it's almost impossible. Even just the large ones? Even just the large okay. ones. Okay. North Carolina election officials last week rejected a protest by Forsyth County Republicans who said they were voting irregularities in the county. Now, that protest held up a lot of things. Elected officials couldn't take office, they couldn't be sworn in, they couldn't carry out their duties. In general, if protests and lawsuits like this are ruled to be invalid and uh, frivolous, should election deniers be assessed a hefty fine, guys? Okay. I think that's a great idea on every level, from county to federal. Absolutely. Yeah, they break. Well, I think if there's an irregularity and it needs to be looked into, whether it's Republican, Democrat, or whatever, and I, I have no problem with these folks being waiting an extra couple of days before they are sworn into office. Okay, Keith. The, the problem is that we have people who go in who are just trying to muck up the system. Har there are hardly any irregularities in voting, almost None. And, and there's no punishment for people. Right. That, and there's that, no okay. punishment. They're just holding up the system. All right. Finally, a new study by Cornell University says that couples who share a bank account are happier and stay together longer. Guys, have you ever shared a bank account with a woman and were you happy about it? Ogie Overman. For 38 years I have and I'm fine. Worked yeah. out with it. I better, my wife better be happy with it. Too. Yeah, well, we'll ask, her, we'll, we'll ask Janet later. Dave. Working fine for me now. No problem. Keith, have you ever shared a bank account with a woman and were you happy about it? I shared one and, and now that I looked at my bank account, she has a new car. I'm not happy about it at all. <laughs> <laughs> I just saw it drive yeah. up in the driveway. Yeah. I'm well, not happy at all. See, I didn't, no, didn't, no, didn't no, work no. out. Didn't work out. It didn't out, work really. out for me. Yeah. All right. Well, that's all the time. That's all the time we have. Oh, except for this. Uh, a Concord, North Carolina woman just had a baby last week, a beautiful baby girl. And a couple hours later, she found out she'd won $100,000 in the North Carolina Powerball lottery. A reporter came up and asked her, said, are you surprised? She said, no, I knew I was pregnant. <laughs> she didn't understand the question. But for, all, for all of us here, including Diane's mom, that's an inside joke. I'm Jim Longworth. Happy holidays. We'll see you next time.